Father, we just pray for Brother Jeff as he's uh, heading out, traveling this week. Father, just pray you give him safety and bring him back home safe. And Father, just pray now that you would give uh, Brother Justin a fresh anointing from on high. Help him to get out of your way this, this afternoon. And Father, please help us with the, with the Holy Spirit to take the word of God and, and his, the truths there to help us apply it to our life and strengthen us, Father, that we might be able to shine like this dark world and we might better lead others to Christ and bring you glory and honor and praise so rich you deserve. Thank you again for all you do provide. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, turn your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter number 13. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to preach, and uh, thanks for the hospitality that I've been here on and off uh, since April uh, for work here, and uh, this will be my last week, um, although I've said that last time also. <laughs> so, yep, just a disclaimer again, if there's anything I say that is different than what Pastor Jeff teaches or preaches, I'm wrong and he's right. So Luke 13, look at verse number 1. Luke chapter 13, verse number 1. The Bible says, in Luke chapter 13, verse number 1, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I'll tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now the title of the sermon uh, this afternoon is called, The Christian Response to Hurricane Ida. <laughs> the Christian Response to Hurricane Ida, or the better title will be, uh, Natural Disasters in Light of the Bible. Natural Disasters in Light of the Bible. Now, Hurricane Ida has, uh, that was two weeks ago, and we know uh, we have loved ones, we have families, friends, relatives that's been suffered uh, loss uh, in material, and uh, some families has lost uh, loved ones. Now, let me just read uh, to you uh, the articles about Hurricane Ida. It says that Hurricane Ida was a deadly and destructive Category 4 Atlantic hurricane that became the second most damaging and intense hurricane to strike the U.S. state of Louisiana on record behind Hurricane Katrina. The storm also caused catastrophic flooding across the northeastern United States. It has caused at least $50 billion in damages. As of September 7th, a total number of 109 deaths has been confirmed in relation to Ida. So we have natural disasters like the hurricanes, uh, we have the earthquakes, tsunamis, hails, snowstorms, blizzards, tornadoes, so on and so forth. And the other natural disaster I can think of is the uh, California wildfire. Uh, in 2021, um, as of, as of September 11, 2021, a total of 7,300 fires have been recorded, burning over two, uh, 2 million acres across the state. At least 3,000 buildings have been destroyed by the wildfires. So we've witnessed a lot of natural disasters, if you will, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, so on and so forth, fires. So sometimes we, sometimes we start asking the questions, right? Why? You know, uh, the uh, unbelievers will, uh, will ask something like this. How can a loving God allow evil like this, you know, allow the natural disaster to exist? But from an atheistic perspective, that question does not make sense. You know, if they ask why uh, did God allow the hurricane, allow the evil to take place? Because in order to say something as evil, there has to be something as good to measure what is evil, right? There has to be a standard. It's like, you know, there, there, there will be no darkness if there's no light. There's nothing to compare yourself into. 
This is the classic uh, moral argument. You know, in, in order to imply something as evil, they have to have a moral law to, in order to differentiate between good and evil. And by implying the moral law, there must be a moral law giver. That's a classic moral argument for a creator. So by asking how can God allow evil to exist, they imply there is a higher standard, the, the ultimate source of good, which is God himself. So from the atheist's perspective, the question does not make sense. Sometimes the atheist would, would, would also argue the Bible, you know, in the Old Testament, how can God allow all the genocide to take place? But in order to call that as evil, there must be a moral law, which God is the moral law giver. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are along to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. So the Bible says, even though unsaved people will have the conscience, we all know murder is wrong inherently because God has put that in our heart. That's the classic moral argument. Now keep your finger in Luke chapter 13. This is our text. We'll leave it when we will come back to it. Go to Psalm number 85. Psalm 85. Now, sometimes people, people would also ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? But you have to define what is good and what is bad. How do you know if certain evil seems to us is bad? How do you know anybody is good? In fact, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. So the question itself does not make sense either. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because uh, in the end, there's no such thing as good people. Some people might be godly. Some people might uh, do good works. But inherently, we are all sinners. But sometimes even Christians would ask, why can't God just end all evil, right? Sometimes atheists will ask uh, that as well. Why can't we just end all evil? But I laugh at that question because if God does end all evil, then you won't be there and I won't be here. So the question itself does not make sense either from, from both perspectives. If God does end all evil, then we won't be here because we are all wicked and sinners deserve to go to hell. So the question self-destruct if we analyze that. So why did God allow hurricane to exist? Why did God just not end all evil? Because if God does end all evil, then nobody will be here. Now, in Psalm 85, look at verse number 10. Psalm 85, verse number 10, the Bible says, notice, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, this is what I believe one of the most uh, loving, beautiful verse in the Bible, because it describes who God really is. God is a just God, right? He must punish evil. He must punish sinners, but he's also a merciful God. That demonstrate, God demonstrate that truth in salvation, right? Why will, yes, sinners Christ die for us. Christ must be just to punish sinners, but God is also a loving God. He wants to save us. When did mercy and truth met together? A perfect just God and the perfect loving God met at the perfect intersection, which is the cross itself. That's where the righteousness and peace, they have kissed each other. So from a Christian perspective, why can't God just end all evil? Because you won't be here. But God is also a loving God. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. So why can't God just end all evil? Because God is also a merciful God. In fact, if, if tomorrow everybody died, God is not wrong because God is a just God. The reason anybody is still living, I can still preach the word of God, is because of the mercy and grace of God. So why can't just God end all evil? Because that doesn't make sense. Because God is mercy. You know, God is merciful. He's also a loving God. So today, I want to give you a Christian perspective on natural disasters. Uh, not the worst perspective, you know, what does the Bible say about natural disasters? So I have three points. Hopefully we can move pretty fast. Point number one, point number one, natural disasters can be judgments from God. Natural disasters can be judgments from God. Second Chronicles chapter 7, look at verse number 13. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13, the Bible says, If I, talking about God, if I shut up heaven, that there will be no rain. Talking about a drought. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. 
tongue about an infestation of some sort, or if I send pestilence among my people. Maybe talking about COVID. I have no idea. Verse 14, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In this case, God is addressing the primary context is the nation of Israel. Uh, the reason God brought the drought, brought the infestation and brought the pestilence, uh, some say that these are the natural disasters, is because they want God wants his people, the nation of Israel, to repent and uh, turn back to God. So in this case, God, God does use natural disasters as a judgment, right? It's for people to repent. And throughout the Bible, uh, we can see a lot of uh, instances about uh, many events that God used natural disasters, if you will, as his judgment. Uh, things like Noah's flood, right? God brought a, uh, a global flood to punish because there's wicked. Uh, the, the earth is full of uh, murderers and sinners. That's why God uh, used Noah's flood. We talk about the ten plagues in Egypt, right? God used natural disasters. By the way, I think it's kind of unfair to use the term natural disasters because I believe every disasters are supernatural because God allowed it, right? Noah's flood is national. It's a it's a natural. Uh, well, it's a supernatural flood because God allowed it. Uh, the reason we have a hurricane is, you know, God obviously allowed that to happen because God knows what he's doing. Uh, things like Sodom and Gomorrah, right? P- uh, p- people think, uh, you know, God himself rained a fire and brings them. But, you know, it's possible that God can allow a volcanic eruption of, of some sort, right? It can also be a natural disaster. In the book of Revelation, we have the six, uh, we have the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials indicating the tribulation time and uh, and, and the wrath of God. We see the famine, the pestilence, the hail and fire, and then the water got polluted, got poisoned. We have darkness uh, for like third part of the day. We have locusts from hell, literally. So we see a lot of uh, instances that God does use natural disasters as a judgment, and even in the New Testament eras. Uh, we have the city of Pompeii, you know, we have the city of Pompeii in 79, 79 AD. Now, the city of Pompeii is a wicked city, you know, it, it, it's in the New Testament era, uh, the city is full of sodomy, and then the wickedness, and fornication, and adultery, and it was destroyed by a literal eruption by a volcano in the New, in the New Testament era. That makes me think of the Californian fire because that state is full of wickedness too. So I do believe Californian fire is a judgment from God. Now, go back to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Let me, let me read to you Amos chapter 3 verse number 6. The Bible says, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? See, that's a pretty scary verse because the context is talking about the judgment of God uh, to a nation, which is Israel. The Bible says, shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it. Sometimes God used evil things uh, to exercise his judgment. Now, God does do evil sometimes because the word evil does not always mean sin. All sins are evil, but not all evils are sin. Evil simply means inflicting harm to, to some people, right? If, you, if the government exercises death penalty, they are doing evil. They are doing, things, doing something harmful, but that's not necessarily always a sin. So I said point number one, natural disasters can be judgments from God. Because in the Bible, there are a lot of instances God does use natural disasters as his judgment. But point number two, you are in Luke 13. Natural disasters may not be judgments from God. In Luke chapter 13, the story we, we, we just read, look at verse number 1 again. Luke 13, verse number 1, the Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, what was that event like? Uh, I don't really know. Maybe Pilate killed the Galileans for sacrifice to his own God. Or maybe uh, Pilate killed them to get money from from these people to sacrifice to his God. You know, some events like that. This is the acts of man, not, not necessarily the natural disasters. 
So there were people asking Jesus Christ,、uh, I would assume, you know, these people, Gal- these, these Galileans, they were killed by Pilate. You know, are they sinners above all? You know, look at verse number two. The Bible says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that those Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? So the question that's being asked, you know, those Galileans have, have, have been killed directly or indirectly by Pilate. Are they,、uh, is that because they were sinners above all the Galileans? Look at the answer of Jesus Christ in verse number three. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Verse, verse number four of these eighteen, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? See, there's a tower that, that fell and killed eighteen people. You know. Are they sinners above all that dwelt in Jerusalem? Verse number five I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the issue in this case is not that、uh, the tower fell, those disasters are a judgment of God. You know, the, Jesus Christ clearly said they were not sinners above all. So natural disasters may not be always the judgment from God. For example, the story of Job, right? The fire burned his sheep and servants. The wind smote the four corners of, of the house, right? The building collapsed and killed Job's sons and daughters, right? And we know Job, Job, Job is a righteous man. You know, in Job 42, verse number 7, when, when the Lord is speaking to Eli,、uh, Eliphaz, God said, My wrath is kindled against thee, talking about Eliphaz, and, and against thy two friends. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. See, the,、uh, Job's two friends, as well as Eliphaz, h a s been accusing Job. The reason there's so many bad things happen to you is because you are wicked and you are sinful. But God said, You have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. So, not all natural disasters are a judgment from God. So, the question is, how do you know whether this event or that event are judgments from God? Well, I'm pretty sure you know in your own heart if you have any unconfessed sins. I, I know you know for sure in your heart that if you have done some wicked acts, you know, you know, sometimes when bad things happen, you wonder is that a judgment or is that a trial? So, so let me ask you this. When something bad happens, ask yourself, are you a Job? Because Job knows himself, right? Are you a Job? Or are you a Jonah? Because Jonah disobeyed God's will and then he ended up to be swallowed by a whale for three days and three nights. Now, I have no doubt, you know, in Hurricane Ida, there are、uh, wicked sinners that have died. But I also think, you know, there are some righteous people that are dead, right? For example, in, in the California fire, you know, there are a lot of people that they, they lost their home, they, they lost their lives. I don't believe everybody are wicked above all people, right? You know, obviously, you know, there are, there are a lot of、uh, wicked people living there. Now, now in Luke chapter、uh, 13, let, let's look at verse number four again. Luke 13, verse number four, the Bible says, All those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, thinking that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. You know, that makes me think about what we just remembered yesterday, the 9 11. This verse can also be read as this All those three thousand upon whom the tower in New York fell and slew them, thinking that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in New York. Right? Same idea. The tower fell, the,、uh, the World Trade Center fell, killed all those people. Now, now, some people may think, you know, it's a conspiracy, it's an act of man, blah, 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 or, or, or if the Taliban truly did that. But, but that did not really matter because people still died, right? Pe- people still died. So the question is are they judgments from God? Now, now I have no doubt. There are a lot of wicked people that have love of money that work there, but I also believe there are a lot of righteous people that have been killed. So the question is not, are they sinners above all men? And Jesus Christ clearly said, no. So natural disasters may not be judgments from God. So I say, number one, natural disasters can be judgments from God. Number two, natural disasters may not be judgments from God. But point number three, 
Natural disasters are God's way to teach us to repent. Natural disasters are God's way to teach us to repent. Let's go back and look at Luke chapter 13 again. So the question has been asked, these Galileans have been killed, are these sinners above all? Look at verse number 2 of Luke chapter 13. Luke 13 verse number 2, the Bible says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that those Galileans were domestics, sinners above all the Galileans. Look at verse number 3, I tell you nay, but exactly you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the Bible does not even say those people that have been killed are not sinners. The Bible, the Bible just said they are not sinners above all. What does that mean? What does that mean? You, God is telling those people who ask that question, you are sinners just like them, right? Same thing as uh, in, in, in verse number 4. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men? I tell you, nay. See, the question is not that they are more wicked. The question is they are sinners just like you. And then Jesus Christ said, But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So, so, the, so the issue is the lesson of repentance. The lesson of repentance. Now, I believe this can apply to both believers and unbelievers. Both believers and unbelievers. Now, the word repent simply means a change of mind to turn to rethink um, so let me just talk to you something about repentance for believers, because I believe most people here are saved. Now, I believe believers ought to repent on a daily basis. Believers ought to repent on a daily basis. You know, Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that I die daily. What did he mean? He died to himself, right? He died to, to himself every single day. The Lord Jesus Christ said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. King David said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, a Christian life should be full of repentance every single day. We ought to repent of our sins as believers every single day, like Apostle Paul, like, 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 like the disciples, and like King David. Now, we read 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter, Chronicle, chapter number 7. God used the drought, the locusts, to God even sent pestilence to as judgment so that his people will, will repent. If my people, which I call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and God will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now the context is talking about the nation of Israel, but it can also apply to believers uh, now. If believers, which are called by God's name, will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, God will forgive our sins and heal our land. See, the issue is God expects believers to repent on a daily basis. The, 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 the reason the story is giving Luke 13 is because we are never, we are not promised tomorrow. Tomorrow is not guaranteed, right? In James chapter 4, the Bible says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So the Bible says your life is like a vapor. The reason God gave you the story is not to compare you or they are more sinful than you. Those people have been slain during 9-11, during, during, uh, during the hurricane. Those are more wicked than you. The issue is the issue of repentance. God wants to tell you tomorrow is not promised. Get right with God today. Amen. See, the issue is not the issue of they are more wicked. The issue is God wants to teach us the lesson of repentance because you are not promised tomorrow. But God also expects believers to be profitable servants. God also expects believers to be profitable servants. Now in Luke 13, look at verse number 6. Luke 13, verse number 6. This is the parable of the fig tree. Now, I don't think it... I don't think it is a coincidence that this parable comes right after the parable talking about, you know, the natural disasters, if you will. Now, the parable of the fig tree, ha I believe, has, ha has a lot of meanings. I, I, I believe the primary application is to the nation of Israel. But I, I also believe this, this can apply to believers also. Luke 13, verse number 6, the Bible says, He also, he spake of this parable. A certain man, I believe he is referring to God the Father, 
had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found now. Now, again, like I said, I believe the primary application is talking about the nation of Israel, but it can also apply to believers uh, because that does not contradict to the truth taught in the clear scriptures. I believe the certain man is referring to God the Father and the fig tree, you know, in this case, talking about believers, and God has come to find fruit thereon. Now, what is fruit? I believe, I believe it's talking about good works, profitable works, if you will. Verse number 7. Then said he unto the dresser of the, his vineyard. Now, I believe the dresser of, of his vineyard can, you know, typify the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found down. Cut it down, white cumberth the ground. So, so, so from this, you know, I believe God sometimes gave us a timeline to produce works, right? God gave us a timeline to produce works. And the Bible says the unprofitable servants will only be a burden, right? They will cumber the ground. Look at verse number 8. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and down it. So this verse tells us, you know, God... Is patient. You know, God will give us another chance. And if you still do not repent, if you still do not bear fruit, He's going to dig about it and He's going to down it. You know, He's, he's going to, you know, fertilize. You know, uh, He's basically taking you out. Now, now, now the word down is, is an interesting Bible study. Uh, I, I'm not preaching a uh, sermon on down, but down is basically poop. Uh, well, the, let, 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 me just read, let, let me just read to you Malachi chapter 2, verse number 3. Now, the context is addressing to the priest. Malachi chapter 2, the Bible says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread down upon your faces, even the down of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. See, God has something to say about these priests who, who are not doing His will, who are, who, who, are, who, are, who are disobeying His commandments. So God said, I'm going to spread down on your face. Our God is a, is a wonderful God. You know, He, sees, he, he sees sometimes uh, say things, you know, I believe, I believe God is absolutely right. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, there are preachers, there are priests, you know, who, 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 who have, de- who have de- deliberately disobeying God. You know, God said, I'm going to spread down upon your faces. Uh, in, in the case of Luke, you know, if you do not produce fruit, God will down you, basically. Look at verse number 9. And if it bear fruit, well, it, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. What is he saying? Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. For believers, you will perish physically. Keep a finger in Luke 13. Go to John chapter 15. Go to John chapter 15. Now, salvation is eternal. Once you're saved, you're always saved. In fact, I preach a whole sermon here called Once Saved, Always Saved. But sometimes... You might be so wicked after you are saved. You might not produce works. You know, God will deem you uh, useless. God might take you to heaven uh, early, right? He might kill you physically. John chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. It's a famous story about the vine and the branches. John chapter 15. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, I am the true vine. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me and beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, who is he talking to? The, the, the contact is every branch that is in Christ, right? Who are the branches? Believers who are in Christ, right? So the contact is talking about believers. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, and that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Notice this. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, some preacher will use that to teach you can lose your salvation because you'll be burned. 
right? But I believe, you know, uh, if you disagree, that's fine. I believe the context is talking about believers. If you, if you are saved, if, if you are the branch in Christ, but if you don't abide in him, you don't, you don't draw nutrients from him, eventually you will get burned. God might kill you. God might take you out, take you to heaven because you are of no use for him. Now go to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Do you know God expects us, God expects Christians to do good works? The most famous salvation verse is, is, is Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we are saved unto good works. Works do not save you, but we are saved to do good works. In Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved. So who is Apostle Paul talking to? My beloved. Talking about believers, right? Save people. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Don't miss this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, somebody will say, see, you have to work your way to heaven. First, that's not what the verse even said. The Bible does not say work for your salvation, but work out your salvation. Second, the Bible is talking to the, my beloved, talking to Christians. What does that mean? You know, it's like working out. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do some barbell, bar, bar, barbell curls to work out my bicep. Do I really have my bicep? Yes, now I'm going to work out for it, right? Same thing like this. The Bible says, work out whose salvation? Your own salvation. So you already have the salvation, now work out it, right? So as believers, we, we ought to work out what God had worked in. Because salvation is an inside work, right? He has given us, he, uh, we are a new creature, we are a new man spiritually, but we still have the old flesh. So the Bible says that we ought to work out what God has worked in. So believers ought to do good works. God expects us to be profitable servants, but because if you don't, you might likewise perish physically as believers. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. I believe God also wants to use natural, natural disasters to help us focus on spiritual things. God, God, God used natural disasters or, or, or even acts of man to help us focus on spiritual things. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 is a passage about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, now I don't want to go uh, too long, but there are two, two, there are two judgments. There is a uh, judgment seat of Christ, which I believe happened before the millennial reign of Christ. There's also the great white throne judgment. Now, now, the great white throne judgment is a judgment upon all unbelievers. I believe at the end of the millennium uh, is basically God condemning unbelievers to hell. But the judgment seat of Christ is God is going to judge uh, Christians, judge believers according to their works, whether they are profitable or not. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. The Bible says, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So the God used uh, an analogy of building to illustrate the principle of the judgment seat of Christ. Verse number 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed on how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what is he saying? When you are, once you are saved, you, know, you have the foundation of the building, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are building upon that foundation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. He's, he's, he's telling you, pay attention on how you build upon the foundation, right? You are building. Look at verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, these are spiritual works, I, I believe, uh, things of eternal value, wood, hay, stubble, I believe it's talking about the material things, you know, the things that, that are physical. For every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. 
See, I personally do not believe you will be judged. Uh, your your sins will be judged. I believe uh, you will be judged upon 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 the works you are you are producing as believers at the judgment seat of Christ. Whether they are gold, silver, and precious stone, whether they are of eternal value or whether uh, they are physical, whether they can be burned up. Look at verse number fourteen. If any man's work abide which he had built there upon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what is he saying? If you are saved, and if you have good works unto God, you know, if you do things for him, you will receive reward, right? Work did not save us, but work shows that, you know, we are God's children and we will be rewarded in heaven but those people who do not have work, uh, who, who do not have profitable works, the Bible says he, uh, his work shall be burned, right? The wood, hay, and stubble will be burned, but himself shall be saved. Still, he's still saved, even though he, he's living unto himself. So I believe God used natural disasters to teach us that God wants us to focus on spiritual things. I drove to uh, New Orleans on Friday just to pick up some things for work. And I saw, you know, uh, a neighborhood which the hurricane has blown uh, the stuff in, in people's house all over across the street, um, across the lawn. You know, that actually reminds me of this passage, you know. Sometimes we lay up our treasure to ourselves, you know. We have all the wealth, cars, couch. Hey, the hurricane, they're all blown away. See, all the physical things do not matter to you, right? See, all the hurricanes, you know, all of your earthly possessions... Maybe smashed by hail, maybe blown away by a tornado, maybe blown away by a tsunami, right? Maybe blown away by a hurricane. Hey, the tower may fail, then you know, destroy billions of dollars worth of uh, material, infrastructure, technologies, right? So the Bible is trying to teach us, lay not up for yourself treasure upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Because natural disasters, what, what do natural d- d- disasters do? They destroy physical things, right? But, but, but if you store up your treasure on heaven, nobody can destroy them. See, God used natural, natural disasters to teach us to repent, to think about we need to focus our attention on spiritual things rather than physical things. So how can you lay up treasure onto heaven, onto God? What about soul winning? You know, lead people to the Lord and nobody can take that salvation away because salvation is everlasting. How about investing in people, investing in your family, investing in your children? How about getting closer to God? These are all spiritual things that nobody can take away. No hurricane will blow that away. No flood will drown that away. You know, lay up yourself treasure upon God, upon heaven to do profitable works. Let's go back to Luke 13. I'm almost down. Luke chapter 13. And, and, and who knows, there won't be any good come out of the, the hurricane. Because we only focus on our finite uh, thinking as human beings, but we don't see the bigger picture. You know? Talking about 9-11, you know, a lot of people died. But I also heard a lot of people turn to God after that. You know, talking about the hurricane, you know, a lot of people may cry out to God. You know, they might actually get saved. They might actually do some great works for God. So sometimes when, when you think something as evil, but think about that, you know, God knows what he's doing. Like uh, the story of Joseph, right? He has, you know, he, he has been betrayed by his, you know, siblings, you know, brothers and sisters, just brothers, you know. But then, but then, but then Joseph said, you thought evil against me, you know, but God meant it for good. So, so, so what's the Christian response to, to Hurricane Ida? You know, I'm all for, you know, giving them supply, gas, food, you know, tar, everything like that. But don't forget, use this time to invest in, in people's spiritual life. Because every time when persecution or uh, disasters take place, sometimes it will help people draw closer to God. Actually, during, um, during COVID, there are more people who answer the door uh, than people who uh, you know, don't. You know, just from my personal experience, people are more likely to talk. You know, they, want to, they want to engage. They want to know what's going on. Hey, share the gospel with them. 
you know, lay up your treasure upon heaven. Luke 13. So I talk about repentance for believers, right? As Christians, we ought to repent. We ought to uh, die daily. We ought to take up the cross and follow Christ. We ought to focus on spiritual things. But, but, but very briefly, let me talk about repentance for unbelievers. Repentance for unbelievers. Because the Bible says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I believe, I believe this can also apply to unbelievers because you know, if people are not saved, they will likewise perish eternally in hell. The Bible says in uh, Revelation chapter, chapter 21, verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and, 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 and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the Bible teaches that the sinners who without Christ will die and go to lake of fire. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish in hell eternally. Now, the word repent simply means to turn. You don't have to quit drinking, smoking to be saved. You know, you have to turn uh, from your dead works to trust in the living God. You simply have to change your mind and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, uh, the, the, uh, this, this is spoken by John the Baptist. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is, is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. For the unbelievers... You know, the natural, natural disasters can be a reminder. Tomorrow is not promised. You know, except you repent, you shall likewise perish eternally. So natural disasters can draw both believers and unbelievers closer to God. So I said, number one, natural disasters can be judgments from God. Number two, natural disasters are, uh, may not be judgments from God. I said number three, natural disasters can be God's ways to teach us to repent for both believers and unbelievers. For believers, we ought to focus on God. We ought to focus on spiritual things because if you don't produce profitable works, hey, God might kill you physically because you're of no use to him. Because, you know, I've heard a lot of stories of truly saved Christians. They've lived a wicked, worldly life and God take him home early, right? So do not be like uh, these unprofitable servants. And as unbelievers, you know, the natural disaster should scare them to death. Because if they die, you shall all likewise perish spiritually, eternally in hell. So, so, so in conclusion, what is the question? The Christian response to Hurricane Ida is rather a Christian response to all natural disasters or even persecutions and afflictions. Rather than asking why God, why did God allow evil to exist, the question does not even make sense. Instead of asking that, asking what is God trying to tell me? What is God trying to teach you? In, 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 in the case of the natural disasters in Luke chapter 13, the one lesson is to us for us to repent. Tomorrow, you may die. Today, you may die, right? I may, I may uh, drive out and then a tornado form and blow me away. I have no idea. You know, tomorrow you may die, today you may die. What is your legacy on this earth for both believers and unbelievers? Do you have the courage like Apostle Paul when he said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith? Because we are not promised tomorrow. You know, we should get right with God today. People should get saved today. We should have the sense of urgency to preach the gospel. And as Christians, hey, let's be profitable servants let's do good works unto god because our labor is now in vain in the lord let's pray dear lord thank you so much for this time to proclaim your word father lord i pray that you help us uh, be profitable servants and do good works unto you lord i pray that we'll uh, lead many souls to Righteousness, Lord, I pray that we'll use this time to, uh, to, uh, to, sh- to share the gospel, Lord, to reflect upon our Christian life and to draw us close to you, to abide in you. And I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.